Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57-page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world-class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership, It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now, my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out, John O'White, or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader, and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult, and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Matt Burrows. Matt is the CEO of Boab Health Services, uh, based in Broome in Western Australia, but servicing the whole Kimberley um, region, which is, if you don't know much about Australia, one of the most um, beautiful parts of Australia and arguably the world. So uh, really interested to chat with Matt. Welcome to the podcast, Matt Burrows. Thanks very much, Shauna. Glad to be here. 
Yeah, I think I was saying before we pressed record that I, I think there'll be a lot of people who are very um, interested in, in what you do and the services you lead for a number of reasons, not just because you might be in a different industry to some of our listeners, but also um, I'm really interested to know what it looks like to deliver health in such a vast um, region, you know, part of where you're based. Uh, so can you tell us about what you do at Boab Health Services and, and what do you do as CEO as well? I'll leave the second part, uh, what I do as a CEO, uh, and explain firstly what BOAB Health Services do. Um, yeah, thank you. We grew out of a national movement many years ago called the Divisions of General Practice, which was really where the government was trying to get general practitioners more involved in health policy uh, rather than having uh, the, the hospital doctors dominate the, the policy scene. And uh, and from that, you saw a major push in Australia to to emulate primary health care and, and localise it as much as possible. From that was born a discrete small health service in the Kimberley region of WA. Uh, we, we'd done what others hadn't in the cities and, and actually built up health services themselves rather than just supporting GPs and other health services. So uh, when changes were afoot, uh, we decided to ring fence that and, and establish the health service on its own, own feet. Now we employ about 60 staff, predominantly allied health and mental health, that, that's um, podiatry, diabetes education, dietetics, paediatric nutrition, in, in the counselling side, psychologists, social workers, mental health nurses, Aboriginal mental health workers. Um, if you can imagine a region like the Kimberley with a population of 50% Aboriginal, 50% non-Aboriginal, uh, unfortunately diabetes is public enemy number one. Chronic diseases are rampant. There are other diseases like rheumatic heart disease. And unfortunately, there are, there are, there are um, gonorrhea and syphilis and other STIs, chlamydia, that, that are prevalent too. So no end of work, unfortunately, um, but a very vibrant, energetic workforce um, to, to be managing. And, and we don't do it alone. Happily to say we've got Aboriginal medical services based in eight, each of the six major towns, as well as hospitals that we work with, the government-run uh, hospitals. Um, and, and for those not in Australia, uh, we also have an absolutely wonderful uh, institution in Australia called the Royal Flying Doctor Service. Uh, and our staff work very closely, often hitching rides on their planes out to the rem remote communities to deliver those services. So chronic disease is, is in our sights um, so that people can get on top of their chronic diseases, live good, healthy lives, grow strong, live well, as we say, and, and if they do um, get in the grips of a chronic disease, to be able to nip it in the bud earlier and be able to self-manage and have an independent life going forward. And, and of course, in a business sense, it makes sense because that becomes less of a burden on the health service as people get older. Um, so we deliver services in the major towns with those staffs, uh, staff, but a lot of the work is done in the remote communities and, and hopefully in people's homes where they live in their natural settings. Yeah, that's... As, uh, that's as, far as, as far yeah. as the CEO, Jono, what do I actually get to do? I get the joy of actually managing those 60 staff and, and mm -hmm. making sure really that they're all pointed in the same direction. When people start with us, I tell them, um, look, you're employed as a professional. You're, you're, you're here to work as a professional, to represent us as a professional, um, to be all you can be as a professional. I'm not there to look over your shoulder. We, we work across 420,000 square kilometres and, and the, the level of autonomy that staff have in that sort of remote work is immense. So we really need people to understand that sense of go forth, be a professional, be all you can be, seek guidance from us, um, but don't always seek the answers from us. There, there is an element of having to make it up as you go. Um, we do yep. have internal control. We're quality certified. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not a fly-by-night outfit, for sure. Um, but, but we do expect staff to have that level of um, get up and go um, to be able to manage in that sort of environment. Yeah, that's that's incredible. Um, I, I think it's 
incredibly important what you do. Uh, my wife, uh, Liz, and I have recently, uh, uh, which I think I just told you before we started recording, we, we recently had our first uh, child, a little boy, Roman, um, two and a half weeks ago. So I've just come back from, from having some time off. Uh, but I just mentioned that because one thing that really stood out to me here in Queensland, in, in Brisbane, where I am, is I was just, we were both just overwhelmed with the quality of healthcare where we are. And um, so I think we are just amazingly, uh, we're just so lucky to have um, incredible healthcare professionals in Australia doing, um, you know, like with us, we're just being such a, a wonderful support. We've just been so well supported but also i just wanted to stop and say thank you for what you do uh, because i know there'll be people having that same experience but in a different context because of of the work of, of boab and your team well you're welcome and on behalf of the staff thank you for acknowledging that um but i just asked john going through the process of having your first child we had our hmm. first child in alice springs which is the town right in the center of australia yeah um and we actually found that quite easy. We had our second child in Perth, which is a, the capital of Western Australia, a, mm -hmm. a city of about two million people. And we found that extremely complex. Um, you, you're sent over that side of the city for antenates, you're sent over this side of the city <laughs> for your, your, your pathology, you're sent back over that side of the city. And uh, I just, the health system, as good as it is, mm. is extremely complex. And, and I'm, I'm a university qualified person who speaks English as a first language and I find it incredibly complex. You've only got to walk into any hospital in, in the country, in, in the city, and mm. realise how complex health is when you look at the, the sign to find out where to go. Mm -hmm. um, the, the number of things that end in ology is just amazing in the <laughs> English language. Yeah. But um, imagine if you're from a culture of 50, 60,000 years old that, mm. that doesn't speak English, you, you mm -hmm. speak four or five traditional languages, um, you've got a very different values-based system, mm -hmm. you're, you're sent from the Kimberley region two and a half thousand kilometres down to the city, well off your own country, mm. and you have to navigate that same health system to manage your chronic diseases. I mean, they're, they're some of the challenges that we face. We can have the best health system in the world yeah. But unless it actually relates to the people we're serving, it's not actually going to be that good. And, that, and that's what we have to be very careful of going forward. Uh, when we talk of first world countries, we, we have to remember that not everyone's um, speaking the same language. Yeah, I love that you mentioned that because we, it, I did think that at one point um, through the process in terms of for us, you know, going and we went to different classes and... I I did find there were certain points where we were confused about what we needed to do or not to do and then we would sort of get answers. And I thought, and I remember saying to Liz, and Liz said to me at different times, how on earth do people do this? We were just thinking about people who didn't necessarily have the support. Um, so people who had moved to a location, uh, moved to a location without family around them. But I can't even fathom the challenges of, like you've mentioned, um, I know we had some people in classes with us who were from other countries and so it was English as a second language. Just that alone, let alone um, the, the cultural differences. So, um, no, I mean, my, my answer would be I can't even imagine because as good as it was, I, I think you're right. I think it did. There were still times where it was complex for us. Um, so I, I think it's really important that people in your sector are thinking like that. It's in interesting when you look at international charters of, of human rights mm. and um, one of the simple things that I noticed when my wife first gave birth in Alice Springs, there was a, a slight emergency, as happens, and it became a caesarean very quickly. Yeah. She had to sign a consent form for a caesarean um, procedure, but when asked what language she spoke, she said Lao, and they realised that they didn't have the document um, translated into Lao, they only had Thai. She spoke Thai as a second language, so that'll do. So they're, yeah. the, they're the compromises that, that you make. You promise that you'll deliver it in someone's own language, but when you don't have the form actually in that language, you go to the next best thing. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think whilst we can all agree to be pragmatic, we've got to be careful about those promises 
that we make. Yeah, that's that's um, <laughs> that's an important moment and a um, not something you want to be having any misunderstandings about when you're when you're signing consent for a major surgery like that. So that's a good example. Well, I, I want to hear a bit about your story, Matt. I know listeners love to hear you know the story someone like you who's leading on the front line doing an amazing job in um like you know just i i appreciate you sharing about 400 and something thousand square kilometers like that's uh people need to go and google that to realize that how vast for those who aren't really familiar with australia just how vast the region is you um you support uh but tell us if we go back to your childhood so when matt was growing up let's start there what were the moments or were there any themes as you reflect that really shaped you to become the person and the leader you are today? I was one of those kids um, from Australia, born in Perth, Western Australia. My father was an engineer who um, worked for an American company, so quickly found ourselves leaving the fair shores of WA to head over to Canada, um, and from Canada over to the UK, where he worked up on the the east coast, the chemical belt, I think they call it, um, up around Teesside, Middlesbrough, and um, where my younger brother was born. And, um, and then back to Australia, when I think we were going into high school years, he wanted to bring us back um, to Australia. So probably my, my memory from that period is changing schools often, Jono. And, and I think what that ingrained into me when I look back on it is a sense of adaptability. Um, and I, I, I think of Darwin uh, and, and that theory of evolution. Um, it, it's not the strongest, it's not the most intelligent that will survive, it's those that are able to adapt. And, and I think in management that rings very true as well. Um, if I look at my career uh, in the public service, um, in the corporate world, back to now not-for-profit, which is what I've been doing probably for the last decade and a half, it, it has been my adaptability that has seen, that, that has been the key to my success, um, and and I think that was well ingrained in those early years. Yeah, that's it, it, it's amazing how often that comes up actually in people's stories, um, and not just educators. That's why it's great to hear you share that. What are, are there any um, examples that come to mind of adaptability? from maybe from your childhood or it could be from recent in work or where you you sort of think oh yeah that was probably a good example of where I was able to pivot and to to change and it probably came more easily to me partially because of some of that experience when I was younger and and just having to adapt Um, any any stories that come to mind around adaptability that really stick out to you? I think um, changing from Aboriginal Affairs, where I I really was a jack of all trades, master of none, um, in in Aboriginal Affairs really what you're addressing are the social determinants of health. Um, You're addressing housing, overcrowded housing, you're you're addressing poor employment um, outcomes, lack of education, you're addressing municipal services, um, grey water, building, construction, um, etc. And and you have to have a piece of knowledge of all of those aspects of community life. And then moving into the health sector where I'm just working in health and, and the pivot from a jack of all trades to all of a sudden being a regional manager of a federal department in the middle of the country, uh, having to have some knowledge. Uh, I remember one elder, um, the chairperson of Tongue and Gear Council in Alice Springs, Okay, Matt, what, what's primary health care? Can you, can you explain that to me? All these bureaucrats have been giving me those long-winded... Well, Willie, uh, yes, um, primary health care is, is really primary, isn't it? It's your yeah. first point of contact with the health service. Um, I, I think I, I backed myself up enough to know how to give an answer, but also how to tell Willie I'm not an expert, so I'm giving you the layperson's version. Um, I think the same thing happened actually when, when um, in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission they, they held a plebiscite and nobody on the ground actually knew what a plebiscite was. And, uh, and I referred to um, the Gladiator mm. movie and I said, you know, it's when they, the gladiators are in the ring and, and they, they've 
got one of the gladiators down and then ask the crowd, do they live or die? And they use their thumb to say up or down. That's a plebiscite. Everyone, everyone said, oh, thanks for that. <laughs> um, you're, you're, you're That's helped me. <laughs> I, I think um, it, it probably also speaks to authenticity and, and having a comfort within yourself that you're not needing to be an expert in everything. Um, and, and I think as a CEO, as a manager, as Steve Jobs said, your most important role is to surround yourself with people that are more intelligent than yourself. Um, and and I, I certainly take that to heart. You, you, you do try to do that, and then your job really is to keep them all aligned and going in the same direction. Um, and I think you, mm. you need a level of authenticity to be able to just speak truly, um, acknowledging that you're not the expert in the room on everything, and, and being adaptable... Um, to take a lead when you need to and to be able to follow when you need to mm. as well. Yeah, I really like how you put that, that it's about surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you and then keeping them aligned. And I think um, that's pretty much a lot of leadership, particularly when you're leading teams. I, I, I really like how you put that because if you can do those things well, um, not be threatened by people, hire great people who are smarter than you and then find out and learn how to really align and keep a team rowing in the same direction towards uh, a team sort of goal that encompasses nearly nearly all great leadership and management in those in those two things that's that's pretty profound it's um i i think the staff can see it in you when when you do that when when you're hunt we, we used to talk of never have a chink in your armour, and, and I'm certainly one who believes those days are well and truly gone. But I'm also streetwise enough to know that people will still exploit when you have too many chinks to show. You, you have to find the balance between being humble and, and having the right drop of humility, um, but also being strong and sincere. Um, staff have enough chaos going on in their lives. They don't need to see it in you as their leader. What they want from you is consistency, mm. fairness and consistency in decision making, um, fairness and consistency in the way that you treat people. And, and if you can do that in an authentic way that they can believe day to day, um, you, you'll find that they do follow. And once they do follow, what you need to do... I, I, I'll stick my neck out here a bit, Jono, and talk <laughs> about surfing. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's almost like you can, you can feel in the team, you can feel the momentum building like mm. the swell behind a wave. And yeah. once you feel that momentum building, what you need to do is actually start riding it like you would surfing a wave. You, you need to, to keep that momentum going because it will keep building... Um, and, and once you've got a team that, that has stuck around for a while, a management team, then, then those in, in leadership positions at a, at a middle level will start really falling into line and contributing. And, and the general workforce then, when they see that consistency, um, and, and before you know it, you've got strong momentum throughout the organisation and, mm. and that's when your life becomes a heck of a lot easier. That's when you <laughs> yeah. realise you don't have to do it all yourself, that actually you've got really good people that, that yes. do it. That's when your delegations become really important because the more that you can offload um, to the people that should be doing it, I, I'm a great champion of getting decisions made as close to the ground as possible where the decision has impact. Mm. Um, the CEO should not be making all the decisions. Um, and, and if you can get to that point where you've got really strong momentum, uh, contributions from all that elements of that, that's when you're surfing. Um, and, yeah. I, and I know it's a bit of a layperson's approach to it, but, but when you feel it, you know it's the right, the right wave. Um, and, and, and then it, it, it's a case of keeping it aligned and going for as long as possible as any good surfer would. Um, and, and probably also knowing when to pull out is, is, um, is the other thing. Go over the lip and paddle out for your next one. Um, yes. There's, there's an element there of um, 
being able to, to get the momentum going to the point where people do start aligning, then mm. building the trust, transferring the control to those people so that they can start making decisions. Have you, have you heard the concept of um, internal, external? How much of your time as a CEO is spent internally putting out bushfires and how much of your time is spent externally networking, building relationships? Um, you know, they, they say that it's, it's an 80-20 rule type of approach. 80% um, mm. of your time should be outward looking, building networks, etc., and 20% should be internal. Uh, I, I'd argue that that's where you want to be. That, that's kind of utopic. There's mm -hmm. not many CEOs, smaller organisations, that would agree that that's where you are. Most would say, actually, and I've been in a room where this is asked of, of 150-odd CEOs. Yeah. Um, most of them said 80% of their time is spent putting out bushfires mm -hmm. um, and 20% is outward looking. I mean, that, that's where you really need to start finding those good people to build around you to get that momentum happening. Because when you can get to the point where really 80% of the internal matters are being managed by your internal management team yeah. um, and, and you get that, that luxury of being able to spend 80% of your time as CEO outward looking, doing things like this, Jono, contributing to the greater management uh, thinking, mm -hmm. um, taking your organisation flag with you as you do it. It's not just Matt Burrows that's speaking here, it's Matt Burrows representing BOAP Health Services. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that, that's when you know you're at the point where, where you've got momentum building and you're doing good things. Yeah, that's, um, there's so much good in there. I uh, think there'll be a few listeners who might rewind the past couple of minutes and listen to that again because that was gold, Matt. Um, I love the surfing um, analogy. I actually think it's great. I, I, I think I'll, I'll be using that. I, I love the – because it is like a swell. It doesn't happen straight away. It builds up. And then once you're riding it, there's nothing like riding the momentum of a cohesive, aligned team. I, I want to ask you about one thing you said, though, because I can just – imagine listeners going, ooh, okay, tell me how you do that, Matt. And that is that idea of making decisions close to the ground. How, what have you learned about how to live that out, how to lead in the real world in a quality assurance, you know, like a, a really um, tight sort of uh, uh, sector that you lead in, in, in healthcare. Um, how do you get decisions made as close to the ground as possible. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably stress that to the lead, to the, the listeners that um, this is within the context of a regulated industry. Um, and the people I work with come from, in some aspects, even more regulated industry. Probably in Australia, the most regulated industry is the aged care industry um, in human services. And uh, certainly we're... we're quality certified across the ISO quality management standards and we're also certified against the national mental health standards. We're looking at certification against the disability service standards for the national disability insurance scheme and we're also looking at going down the quality health service um, standards uh, which we think all health services will in coming years. So you, you've got a regulated environment that you're working within but the idea, uh, you, you also then have internal controls. You, your board of directors make sure that you've got a delegation schedule and, and that that's very clear about finances. That also needs to be very clear about employment practices. It needs to be clear about media and public relations, for example, as well. Once you have all of that in place, it, it's really then about, and, and your internal controls are very strong and you, you have methods to check them, it's then really about saying to people, you are professionals, we trust you, and unless you give us reason not to trust you, we're going to empower you, empower you to make decisions. You, you can spend money, you can employ people. Um, probably the one that we don't let people do is representing the public eye. But we do encourage people to go to conferences, to speak at, at, on, on panel sessions or, or, for example, to do sessions like this. Um, that's part of, of building the broader professional. That, that was another thing that, that's been stated. I think this one was um, Richard Branson. Um, you want to train people up um, so that they can leave you, but treat them well enough so they don't want to. And, and I think that's an important thing 
it, it's about empowering your staff, giving them the right to make decisions, especially with, within their own field or scope, uh, and being able to practice on, on the basis that we trust you. And even if you make a mistake, that's fine, as long as you did it in a in a with sound judgment in an informed way. And uh, and I think that engenders a sense of, of belief and trust in management and, and builds that sense of authenticity, that treat people the way you'd like to be treated yourself. That's how people look upon that, and they really respond to that. Um, you you mm. don't manage for the 1% of people that are being do, who are going to do the wrong thing. You put internal controls in place to make sure that you, you, you know when, when that's breached. You manage for the 99% of people that are going to do the right thing. Yeah, that's um, that's so good. Um, I really appreciate your perspective there. I think what I'd love to do, Matt, is um, I've just enjoyed this so much. I'm just looking at the time and I want to ask you some Leadership Express questions, but perhaps down the track we can do a part two and, and hear a bit more of your story, some of the uh, some of the different milestones along the way that led you to, uh, to the role you're in and maybe cover some different ground we haven't chatted about today. Um, the invitation's there if, if you'd like to come back on down the track and do a part two. Let's see what your listeners feel about that one, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We can go to a plebiscite. To. The thumbs up, thumbs down. No, I, I think uh, I think <laughs> I've really I've really enjoyed uh, chatting with you. I think um, yeah, I I think just the way you articulate things. I, I know you said it's a lay person, but I, you know, I was chatting with a leader recently who said, um, you know, he said to me, he's in the UK, and he said, I'm in this particular sector. And people, you know, they're not like me in this sector. I, I'm really different. And he sort of unpacked how they they tend to be a bit more closed off and a little bit, they really care about their appearance in this particular sector. And he's come in and really been transformational in one organization in the sector because he's very collaborative, um, real down to earth, salt of the earth sort of approach. And, and I said to him, I said, you know what? I, I think your sector needs leaders like you um and it, it reminded me of that when you talked about that lay person approach because i definitely think your sector matt um can be really strengthened by having uh, you know you might call it the lay person's thinking and approach to to some leadership and management but i think i think you're right on the money I, I think it is the more it is the most effective way to answer some of the massive questions like what you shared at the start around what does it look like to walk into a complex healthcare, um, you know, uh, building in Australia if, if you know, if you are coming from a completely different culture. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I mean, transformation is another aspect that, that maybe needs to, to, to wait for part two, but I, I've also been in that position where I, I went into the disability sector as a newcomer and, and purposefully the board chose someone who was outside of the sector to come into it. Mm. And I think I did disrupt it um, with, with my way of working. I, I was less stoic and, and more pragmatic. Um, but you can only do that for so long before the conventional wisdom comes back to claim its space. And mm. I wonder the chap you're talking about in the UK, how he feels, what his experience is. I think when you come in and you bring a different way of thinking to a very traditional um, sector, it, it allows you to do that for so long. But at some point, people say, you know what, we, we get what you're saying. And now we've had enough of that. We're, we're prepared to move so far, um, mm. so quickly, but we're going to take back the control. Thanks very much for it. For, for having you and I think that's where you remember I said with the surfing at yeah. some point you need to know when to go back over the lip <laughs> and paddle out for the next one true yeah <laughs> um, yeah don't 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 outstay your welcome would be my advice as a CEO yeah yeah it's definitely it's it's a skill that doesn't get um I like I'm just trying to think of how many great books have been written about when to leave <laughs> you know it doesn't seem to be it's not something we like to think about that much but it definitely is a skill um, I know it's a bit different, but I love uh, talking about celebrating people coming onto teams and celebrating people finishing up on teams just in terms of our hiring. And actually, 
what does it look like to create a culture where you just mentioned the Richard Branson quote before, but when, when someone where we, we treat people well enough that they, um, or we train them up well enough, they can work anywhere, but we treat them well enough that they never want to leave. Um, but sometimes people do, you know, for them, they realize they've, they need to paddle out. And I think generally great leaders and great organizations, one of the things that, that people can do to take them to another level is really celebrate people who are finishing up and, and honestly and authentically celebrate them and send them off really well, just like we celebrate people who are starting and and coming in. I mean, there's some context where you're not celebrating when someone finishes up when it's, when it's really difficult, but, um, I, that's, that's, uh, definitely been an experience I've had where I think, um, it's easy to just send people off and, and sort of with a bit of a disgruntled, oh, you know, yeah, go well, and but we're a bit sort of disgruntled about the fact they've left. But I, I think, so yeah, I, I think it's a topic that not just for CEOs is actually really worth um, digging into and there's some really important sort of ideas in there. When you, when you work in an industry of workforce shortage um, and, and therapy definitely is, allied health definitely is, Mm. Um, you, you need to understand that people will leave and when they do leave uh, you want them to leave on good terms wherever possible yeah. when they do leave you want them to become a lifelong advocate for your organisation to think that someone's going to start with your organisation at 20 years old when they graduate and finish with your organisation at 65 when they retire is a bit unrealistic today mm-hmm. and, and I think if you can do exactly what you're saying Jono time it right, make sure that they go off with a celebration, they, they will be advocates for your organisation for years to come. They're the yeah. ones that will be talking to new graduates saying, you know what, you really should spend a, time, uh, a, a part of your career at BOAP Health Services, get some remote experience, they're a wonderful bunch to work for. I had yeah. five years there, it was the best time of my life. Mm-hmm. If you can get testimonials like that from your ex-staff members, your, your, your challenge with workforce going forward is going to be a lot easier. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I think that's um, that's so good. And there'll be a lot of leaders listening to this who I think can, that's one thing they can practically go and uh, um, go and work on, how they, how they are helping people to finish well um, when they do leave and, and take other opportunities. And, and all of us as well being uh, doing a reality check, like you said, and realizing, well, what is realistic? Because we'd all love to have people come in at 20 and stay till they're 65 <laughs> under our leadership. But like you said, that's just not realistic in 2022. Uh, so let me jump into Leadership Express. I've just got a handful of questions for you before we finish up, Matt. Are you ready? Go for it. First one is, uh, what is a I'll book that... Book. Yeah. <laughs> What's a book that you've gifted to other people? Um, I, I like Desiderata, Max Ehrman. Um, and I like Escher graphics, both Max's, Max Escher, Max Ehrman. Um, Desiderata, mm-hmm. probably from a public service perspective, um, I, I just think it's a, a it's a nice little poetic commentary on society and what good governance should look like. Yeah. Um, I'm a chartered secretary, so that, that's that runs in my in my DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like Escher's graphics because. Um, it's pictorial. It's it's a way of I, I love the the thought of you know the the um, how would you say uh, Foucault and and that that sense of um, challenging your thinking uh, mm. and uh, and being able to look at things in a from a different perspective and I think Escher captures all of that in in his graphics um i've also found escher graphics to be a wonderful tool to use in a in a cross-cultural environment um, mm. because those sorts of themes can be explained just by looking at at um, ducks and rabbits for example and and mm. you know that that change in perspective that he does so well in his graphics um i i'm i'm a, a teacher by trade I, I've never really taught but did the qualification back at university and it's one of those things that um, it, it sticks with you through life the ability to present the ability to, to um, take a concept explain it and and portray it to an audience 
which is really what teachers do in essence. And, and that, that um, training has, has stood me really well throughout my career as I found myself presenting um, to, to government officials in Laos, to, to tribal elders in the middle of the desert in Australia, and, um, mm. and using tools like the Esh graphics to be able to get complex um, ideas across in, in a non-threatening way um, yeah. has been a really good tool. They're great recommendations, thank you. Do you have any favorite questions that you ask in a, might be in a one-on-one -on -one setting with someone, might be with your team, it might be when you're doing a workshop with a group you haven't, haven't met before, any favorite questions? Look, the one that's probably coming through more often these days is, is okay, um, before we dive into the detail, can I ask people to just have a think about what what does success look like? Hmm. Um, I, I talked about alignment earlier, Jono, and I think if you can get people in a room all sharing an idea, a, a, a shared understanding of what we're actually trying to achieve, what success looks like for, yeah. for whatever we're trying to do. Firstly, it, it keeps you forward thinking, productive. Hmm. It stops you getting bogged down into the minutiae too early. But it, it also brings people on the journey to own what, what that success actually looks like. Yeah, that's great. And I love that question in nearly any setting because um, as an example with coaching, I use, I use a version of that question at the start of every um, session just to, and then also to get people to actually think forward about what success looks like when they're, when we're discussing an area that they're, um, that they're working on or, or discussing a project that they want to turn around, whatever it is. And um, it's amazing how just articulating that, or, you know, it's probably one of those things where sometimes as people think about the answer to that question, they, as they're talking or as they're thinking, they actually realize things they didn't know before. And, uh, and so I love that you mentioned that question because that's, for me, that's, a, that's something any leader can pull out in, in almost any environment and say, what does success look like? like? What is, you know, you say you're drawn into a, a meeting with a with a client or with a key stakeholder, but you come in a bit blind saying, what, hey, can I just ask, you know, what is, what is, what does success look like out of this meeting? What are you really wanting to achieve? We get to the end of it and you go, oh, that was fantastic. Just help me understand that. Um, it's such an insightful question in nearly every context. And that's probably the other permutation of it. If you're going at an everyday level, and you're at one of your everyday meetings, the, the what does success look like simply becomes, what do we want to achieve out of this meeting? Mm. Everyone goes to so many meetings, so, so be more clear each time about what you really want to get out of it. Yeah, it sounds so simple, but it's honestly, it's one of those things that we can get so carried away on complex, uh, you know, other things. But if we just drafted that question into most of our interactions and meetings, I think it would make a, um, a ridiculous um, difference for a lot of leaders out there. So I, I love that. That's a wonderful uh, recommendation. Okay, here's one. Uh, what is a commonly held belief in your sector? So let's talk about the not-for-profit sector. What's a commonly held belief in, not, in non-profits that you passionately disagree with? Um, I'll, I'll speak to the health sector probably firstly, um, sure. and, and the myth that the only good manager is a manager with a clinical background. Um, I, I actually think that's, that, that just engenders groupthink. Um, mm. you, you do need clinical leaders in your leadership team in a health organisation because you're a clinical outfit, but yeah. you equally need non-health people. You, you need people from a corporate background. You, you need people with that governance understanding. You need people, dare I say, with the lived experience background um, mm. to make it a holistic health service. And I think this, this preconceived idea that, that the only people that can manage health are people with a health background is, is completely flawed. Um, and, and yet it's this perpetuating cycle of, of of over expenditure misery, um, <laughs> pour money down down the drain because people aren't thinking any differently. Um, yeah, they're, they're just you know, what what do you need to make health better? You need more doctors and nurses. 
I mean, this is a bit like going back to the, the Shawshank Redemption. The only thing they believe in is more bars, more bricks, more, more guards. Um, mm. you, you, you don't get outcomes by doing the same thing. What, what did they say? The definition of crazy is doing exactly the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. Mm. <laughs> um, I, I think that's something that's perpetuating, it's certainly in the health sector. Um, and, and probably in the not-for-profit sector, um, I, I don't want to get on a soapbox here, um, mm. but the, there's probably a similar sort of um, the not-for-profits all need to become more commercially oriented. They all need to become um, corporate performers and, um, and therefore you need people with a corporate background to run them. Um, I, I think you do need to have commercial acumen on your board and your management team needs to be financially literate. Uh, absolutely. Um, but don't, don't get rid of that DNA of, of benevolence that, yeah. that defines not-for-profits. Um, I, I think you, you really run the risk of, of undoing the great institutions of the world, um, whether mm. it be the Red Cross, Save the Children, uh, one that I'm heavily involved with, Amnesty International. You know, mm. let those mm -hmm. organisations be, be who they are um, and, and nurture and encourage that benevolence to mm -hmm. be all it can be. Give it guidance from the corporate sector, but don't, don't override and overwhelm that, that, um, that sense of who they are. And I think that's something that is happening in, in certainly contemporary Australia, this thinking that they all have to be. And, and look, part of that is, is not just uh, a, um, a belief that people have. P part of it's that the not-for-profit sector has become the training ground for directors going into the, the listed companies. And mm. I, I, I think the not-for-profit sector deserves more, more credit than that and, yeah. and certainly um, a, a little bit more. Yeah, we can do better I agree. than that. In some ways, it's it's um, more important work than the listed companies, and should be, um, yeah. You don't, definitely don't want it to be just a training ground, uh, stepping stone. You want it to be. You want to be having people there who are the best people for those seats. Like you said, not just because of corporate experience or otherwise, but because they're the best people for that organization to live out its values, to have in that in that role at a board level. Um, which is easier said than done. Um, but no, I, I love those two um, observations you made there, Matt. Thank you very much. Um, let me jump to the last question. So if you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say? Oh, um, learn, learn how to be comfortable with yourself. And probably the most important thing is learn how to be comfortable with the awkward silence. Mm. And, and what I mean by that, Dono, is when you're in conversation with people, we have this amazing um, animal intuition to fill the gap. If there's a <laughs> silence in a conversation, it's too awkward to live through and we have to fill it with something. Mm -hmm. As a leader, sometimes the most important thing you can say is what you don't say. Mm. Um, don't feel compelled to fill the void. Let it let it go naturally and be comfortable with yourself and be seen to be comfortable with yourself um, during those moments. Um, it can happen in conversation, it can happen in meetings, it can happen in conferences. I, I think just um, it's part of your authenticity, it's, it's part of you being comfortable with who you are as a leader. It's part of you giving space for others to be able to speak into that void um, rather than you having to keep filling it yourself. And, and if you can do that, you'll find people do step in and, and step up and fill that void for you. Um, and again, that's how you know momentum starts building and you've got a wave that eventually you can surf. How does that sound for you? Oh, <laughs> I haven't had that. I haven't had that mentioned um, as an answer to that question. And I just, I just think it's... Um, it's so profound because I, I would encourage anyone listening who heard that and it resonates with them, but they haven't tried it before to go into your next work day or, or next meeting with your team, particularly if you're the leader, 
um, but even if you're part of a team and to and to practice trying to pause 10 seconds before jumping in, particularly for leaders. And I say this because my experience is I was shocked when I first did this um, that I reckon, I'm going to say 80 to 90% of the time someone else would jump in. Very rarely did the pause last the whole time. And for those who are leading teams, and like you said, want to build that wave, those, you know, nine, eight or nine out of 10 times where people, other people step in and give their opinion or um, share something that they otherwise wouldn't have if you'd jumped in is absolute, like it, it's a game changer. Um, and so that is just wonderful advice for young leaders, but really for all leaders. And I'd encourage people to go and try that. Go and try, um, if you're like me and you need a little bit of a, you need to gamify it a bit to just help you actually, you know, try that. Try a day where you do a 10 second pause throughout the day instead of jumping in whenever you go to say something in a meeting or in a one on one. And you'll be amazed at how often you get to seven or eight and the person keeps talking or someone else jumps in and says, oh, well, yeah, I think, you know, and they go off on a tangent. And you go, wow, I don't know if they would have shared that if I hadn't paused. Absolutely. So, Matt, I've gone over time. Thank you for um, being uh, generous with that. I just want to ask um, for people who are really interested in you and in what you're doing at Boab Health Services, where can people find you uh, and the and the organisation online? Yeah, uh, website www.boabhealth.com.au um, and... Uh, have a read about what we do at Boab Health Services. Um, like most people, uh, later in their career, um, you can find elements of me from, from Governance Institute of Australia through to Amnesty International, um, things that I've been interested in over the years. So um, I, I'd encourage people, my last comment, Jono, is, is Hmm. The organisation that you work for, put your heart and soul into it. it. It's what you do. Take pride in it. But don't let it be all that you ever do. Um, how, do what you're doing now. Listen to podcasts by leaders like Jono. Ha, hmm. Have, a, have a, a go at going to sundown as led by the Institute of Management, for example. Hmm. Get yourself involved in the Governance Institute, Chartered Secretaries, or, or the Australian Institute of Company Directors, or, or whatever the international affiliates would be. Um, spread your wings a little bit. Develop yourself as a well-rounded professional. Um, that, that, that's how you'll get your competitive, competitive edge as a leader. But mm. it's how you get fulfilment from just being a well-rounded professional in, in, in what can be, in, in management, a very non or how would you say, a professional um, environment. Uh, yeah. We are in some ways all kind of all trades masters of none, aren't we? <laughs> yes, uh, hence the imposter syndrome that um, anyone who listens to any of these episodes, you hear so many leaders that we would be, they'd be the last people we expect to have that, but it's it, it comes with the territory, um, realising, wow, sometimes Absolutely. other people don't know what to do and it's about learning how to, lead through that and like you said uh, another thing i love that you said in this episode is about that balance of humility with strength and um not not bringing chaos not being another person who brings chaos into your people's world but leading with humility but having that strength and confidence at the same time living in that tension leading from that tension being willing to say i don't know the answer to that and um you know so oh so much good stuff well uh, i want to thank our listeners for tuning in this has been so much fun chatting with matt i think it would have been a really great investment in a lot of our listeners and there'll be people rewinding and going and choosing different things to implement and and i love that um don't forget i also have the john o white leadership podcast and the leadership question of the day podcast um, if you're interested in continuing to invest in your leadership, there are a couple of other places you can go. Uh, but I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to Matt for being so generous, like I said, but also uh, so much wisdom, um, just great analogies, great thoughts, um, really clearly explained. And uh, I've just it's I've just had a great time um, chatting with you, Matt, and I know it, you will have helped a lot of people through what you shared today. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Welcome, Jono. Thanks very much for the chance. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John O. White, or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. 95% uh, of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time. 